Hey, Jamal. Hi. Hi, Michael. Hi, Ed. Hello. Hi. So we can uh, wait for a few minutes. There are a few students in the class as well. So, yeah. Hi, everyone. Hi. Hi, Vilada. Thank you. Thank you for joining. No uh, worries. How are you? Yeah, I'm fine. Yeah. So. It's really nice that people from industry are here. So hopefully it would be very good for students. Yeah. Yeah. So we are waiting for a few minutes so that people can join. Some students are already in the class. So I'm in the class, so they are not online. But uh, hopefully uh, there would be more students who would be joining us online. Then we can start. So just got to say hi to Kevin. I don't know if you remember we did the internship together back in the day <laughs> um, in SAP. Yeah, hi, Rob. I do. I remember you up in, up in Dublin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so see, that's about three years now, is it? Yeah. yeah I was yeah. like familiar face. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you're with SAP, right? Yeah, I'm still here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm still here. <laughs> um. Hi, David. My eternal struggle with the mute button continues. Hi, guys. Nice to meet you. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Sorry. So, all panel members are here, and uh, I think we can wait. Two more minutes, then we can start. Um, so there are a few students um, who are joining online, and there are some students in the class as well. So it's a mixed hybrid class. <laughs> I'm closing down all of my, my other stuff just to make sure I'm fully present and ready to rock. That's just showing off now. <laughs> <laughs> Put that team on do not disturb. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's pretty much it. I could think of more colorful descriptions. I should log like a feature request with teams or something than, than do not disturb, but hey. <laughs> So I think we can start now. And uh, I would welcome my all panel members uh, to this discussion. This discussion is very informal sort of discussion so that students can learn uh, where, what is cloud computing. Obviously, we are trying to learn this topic in this module, but uh, perspective in terms of from industry people is always good for students. So uh, we have four members in this panel and uh, we don't have any uh, pattern as such. So I would say uh, we would start with a small introduction from you people in terms of what are you doing in your um, job. I will uh, definitely introduce my panel uh, 
but um, it would be good if you can uh, describe what what's your role in the company and how is it related to cloud computing and then um, we can go with uh, its importance and relevance in terms of businesses, uh, individuals and society. And then uh, obviously students can ask questions. And I know students will ask uh, one important question, what sort of skills they should learn if they want to pursue their career in cloud computing. So uh, welcome to all of you and a special thanks to Tom uh, who reconnect you all of you uh, with me. Uh, because I'm very new to this department and I'm just uh, teaching this course first time in the university. So hopefully next time I would contact you directly. Um, so in our panel, we have four people. Uh, Michael Rian is there. So he's from Microsoft. He's working as a Azure CXP engineering manager and uh, definitely um, Azure uh, as a cloud um, provider, we will learn a lot from him. And then we have uh, Ed O'Donnell. So he is a DevOps manager in Globalization Partners. So uh, it would be really nice to uh, have you here in this panel and definitely we will learn a lot from you. And then we have one, um, um, I would say student because Vlada is our student and UIG our department student, so for us, she is still our student, so uh, thank you, uh, Vlada, for joining us. And uh, she is uh, working in SAP as a customer success partner. And from SAP, we have another integration specialist, David. So I hope uh, this panel would be um, good for us to learn uh, how people are, how businesses are dealing with cloud computing. So uh, I think uh, we can start with a small introduction in terms of your work that is related to cloud computing. So I would ask uh, Ed, if you can start. Yep, certainly. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Ed O'Donnell. Uh, I'm the head of DevOps for a company called Globalization Partners. Uh, they're a 10-year-old startup, uh, which kind of doesn't make sense because startups are new, but they've been at it for 10 years now. Um, but the good thing is in that time, they've managed to uh, make the company worth 4.2 billion, which is quite nice. Um, I've been doing IT and DevOps for 30 years now, and I've been in the cloud um, quite literally for the last eight years. Um, DevOps is like IT for customer facing servers. Very, very basic um, description. You'll, you'll hear a million different descriptions. Um, it's about getting the code from the developers onto production, keeping it all running, getting everyone able to do what they should do in the job. That's me. So, Michael, if you can uh, tell what are you doing in Microsoft? Sure. Hey, everyone. So I work in Microsoft, which is a 47-year-old startup uh, based in West Coast US. Um, I work in CXP. We love three-letter acronyms in Microsoft. So CXP is customer experience. And it is basically a branch of engineering that's dedicated to work streams that can drive and change the customer's experience on the platform. Specifically, my team work on the communications and crisis management for the cloud platform. And it's an interesting thing um, from cloud provision simply because what we actually promised to customers and what everybody who works in cloud service provision promises is as much as possible, 100% uptime experience of resources and availability. But what we actually do in the background is we plan and we make strategic provision to make sure that if stuff goes wrong, we get it fixed quickly and also make it as unlikely as possible to go wrong. So in the middle of that, a lot of work streams to make that sort of stuff happen. That's me. Okay, thank you. So I will ask Vilada if you can. Sure. Um, so I think uh, most of the people are familiar with SAP. I'm not gonna say startup anymore, uh, but yes, I am um, currently working in SAP and I'm a, I am a BIS graduate from NYG. Um, I graduated in 2019 and went to work for SAP's customer, um, customer excellence office and uh, what I did primarily at the time was kind of just um, work on um, different implementation projects that the customer had going live and I have supported during the project timeline and uh, I kind of seen how 
it works in the cloud or even sometimes on premise with software systems and software projects and just, you know, um, how many teams are involved um, to, to get something up and running. So I'm working with Success Factors Projects, which is an HR tool uh, that provides the cloud-based software for the kind of human capital management. And um, it's basically software as a service that we offer. Um, as of now, I have moved into a specialist customer success partner role um, because I realized that I am much an advocate of customer success as I am of a, you know, our tools. So my main objective now is to drive customer lifetime value by helping to simplify and orchestrate um, you know, the customer success interactions and activities past the sales that are happening. Um, and I think that's something that I will keep coming throughout this talk, that it's not always just the tools in the cloud. It's also the people and how you understand it and how agile you are and you can simplify the processes and uh, help those that are adapting to it. Because as as much as we are talking nowadays, um, the cloud is more or less a concept that is being adopted. There are still lots of people that you'd be surprised to find, uh, find it quite difficult. And uh, they're still moving from the old mindset to the newer mindset. But yeah, <laughs> just up here. Okay, thank you. So David, um, if you can talk about your... Sure. Thanks, Joel, and, and thanks everyone. Nice to meet you all. Um, so David is my name, I'm based in Galway in the West Coast. I work for SAP as well, along with Lada. Um, I'm a delivery lead at the moment for a solution that we call multi-bank connectivity. And it basically is an integration platform that connects corporate ERPs using SAP ERP systems with their financial institutions. It allows them to exchange digitized payment formats and, and statements and so on. Um, what do I do in there? I'm a delivery lead and a team lead. So I um, work with our product ownership to strategize how we deliver this cloud solution to customers and banks, how we, we, we define the processes to onboard them and connect them, and then also lead the teams that execute that. So that team is about 20 strong and a split between technical integration engineers and customer success managers in the cloud. Um, so that's short. Yeah, that's what I do right now. I suppose, historically speaking, I've been in the cloud. Um, I love that term. And I've been robbing that one from you, Ed. Um, been in the cloud for um, probably about 10 or 15 years now. Um, split between hospitality, started off in the hospitality sector, uh, then into pharma and now into fintech. So that's a little bit of what I do and I suppose my background. So thanks, everyone. Yeah, looking forward to the chat. Thank you. Thank you, David. So, um, like... Ed is working um, with customer facing applications. Like I think uh, nowadays businesses and the internet, they are like, mm, it's very important for them. Like without internet and without cloud computing, we cannot imagine any business to prosper or even expand or in terms of scalability. So uh, I would say uh, first question would be that like, what do you think after 10 years or something, what would be the shape of businesses in terms of scalability issues and how cloud computing can help them uh, to cater that problem? So uh, uh, if uh, anyone can discuss uh, this thing, that would be good because you know, scalability is a main issue. But it's, for, for example, many there are so many startups and even there are so many, there were so many websites like uh, Friendster and there were so many websites uh, better than Facebook or something, but the scalability issue uh, just haunted them and they have to close their websites because they cannot scale their resources well at that time. So uh, yeah, Michael, if you can go. Uh, yeah, there's a couple of things. So I do a lot of recruitment and I do a lot of explaining to sort of early in career people, some of the theoretical theory and framework behind what all cloud service computers are, or providers are doing. Um, the bit that's probably hardest to grasp or is a bit of a mind shift for people is essentially cloud service has commoditized what was a core skill that a lot of companies used to try to specialize in. And the easiest way to think about this, I always use the example of Instagram. And I know I'm going to get the facts slightly wrong, but basically Instagram was sold to Facebook for about one and a half billion dollars a good number of years ago. But at the time, Instagram had fewer than 15 employees. And the reason why they did is they were a born in the cloud company. And by being born in the cloud, they didn't have a whole group of people related to data centers. They didn't have a whole group of people working on connectivity and networking. They didn't have a whole group of people working on patching and 
repudiation and all the other things that you need to do to be a robust and globally spanning service. They outsourced the IT expertise. And by doing that and giving it to a core service provider, which unfortunately was not my company, but by giving it to someone who provided cloud services, they were able to concentrate on their core value. And I think in terms of scalability and where the industry is going, one of the things you're seeing more and more that comes out of cloud service provision is empowering companies to concentrate on what their core value is and what's next comes from companies being freed up to work on that. So that's just kind of certainly started discussion. I know the other panelists here probably really good insights as well, but certainly for me, that's one of the things I think is important to convey. Yeah. Um, for me, there is uh, the, the definition of cloud is that it's computers that you don't own. You're simply renting space on some other person's computer. Um, and this makes it very, very simple. If you go back um, 10 years, uh, my job at that point was to um, put servers into rack mounted data centers. Uh, I'd spend probably half an hour there screwing a server in, plugging all the cables in, uh, adding little labels to, to sticky things to go on the back of it. Nowadays, when I want to expand because we're doing a sale, um, you go click, click with your mouse and 10 new servers instantly spin up. Uh, exactly the same thing happens on the other side when you're finished with your sale, the servers close down again. So you can expand and retract again, incredibly easy compared to how it was done many years ago. So it's a great, great step forward. And I'll add something on this point as well, just really quickly. Um, like you'd see it even with our companies, with SAP and partnering with the likes of, you know, Microsoft for like with services as Azure and you hear the word hyperscaler, it's something that um, it's happening at the moment. So uh, just when like even big companies are trying to do this for the clients and then you partner with, you know, leading cloud infrastructure providers. So again, as I mentioned, Azure or like, let's say Amazon Web Services or uh, Google Cloud Platform, this is all done to ensure that, you know, whatever customers you will have, they'll have this choice and they'll be able to adapt and scale and have a reliable and integrated kind of um, support going forward so i think like we've kept seeing this like buzzwords but now it's it's very important that you know even the the future um i don't know workers employees colleagues people that are students uh, they all understand the necessity of this like having this um hyperscaler move and how this is shaping the future of the cloud and how it is the cloud nowadays Yeah, I think uh, one thing I'd, I'd add there, and, and we, we've all mentioned the words scale, hyperscale, scale, you know, and when I look at that and, and, I, and I look at customers and what they're looking for in the cloud, it is exactly that, it's scalability. I think customers are now looking to cloud providers to provide easily extensible and kind of almost pre-configured integration options via the cloud, you know, that they want that scalability on demand. Also scaling, scale down ability, if that's even a term, you know, I mean, they, they like the, the control, I think, and, uh, and, and the, the ability to do that. And I think from, from my experience of dealing with a lot of customers, that's really what they're after. And they expect it. I mean, I think, I think there's, a, there's a kind of fundamental shift in what customers expect from a cloud provider versus, you know, with your, your, your single silo provider. Um, they expect a lot more. And, and I think it's, it's a shift from reactive to proactive in terms of, 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 of us as cloud providers trying to stay ahead of what the customers want, foreseeing what they want and working very, very closely with them, I think. Um, I could go off on a massive tangent there, but yeah, it's just, just to add on top. Uh. Yeah, okay, thank you, thank you. So, so yeah, um, uh, scalability would be definitely uh, open question for cloud computing and obviously uh, customers and especially if we um, take care about businesses and especially if they are expanding and especially startups, uh, I would say that scalability is a major factor so that they should consider cloud computing as a one solution. And uh, okay, so uh, thank you. So we can go with the next question for today and so next question is what cloud can deliver for businesses like um, in terms of obviously uh, businesses have their own business plans right and uh, do you think um, uh, in, we know that information systems and IT has become strategic resources of many businesses and uh, so if you can uh, discuss uh, this 
um, strategic resources, uh, this cloud computing as a strategic resource, um, or if you can give examples, especially uh, for different type of businesses. So that would be good. So anyone can start or? Uh... I, I could probably give it a go. Um, so I think it, to, to give an example of kind of, how, of, of the business value for, for, for customers and things, I'll just relate it to my own direct experience right now in the solution we work on, multi-bank connectivity. Um, there is a lot of buzzwords, you know, intelligent enterprise is one that you hear. Um, and the cloud really enables customers to make that buzzword a reality. You know, it, 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 it turns this theoretical thing into something practical by connecting systems, sharing data. And, and that is powerful in itself from a business point of view, because you are able to integrate systems to optimize business processes. Um, and I'll again, just focus on, on the own exam, on my own, I suppose, product example that I work on. It's, it's a product that connects customers with banks, fundamentally. It allows them in their ERP systems and their accounting modules to generate payment instructions, which is essentially a file that says, I want to pay money from account A to account B, generate that digitally, send it to our cloud, and we will send that to the financial institution for the, or the bank to go ahead and execute that payment instruction. That sounds lovely, doesn't it, you know, <laughs> from a day-to-day -day point of view. Yeah. The, the, the beauty for the customer in this particular case is that in much the same way as we get statements back from our banks and in our day-to-day -day banking and banks generate that at a business level as well digitized statements and they can transfer that back via our cloud to the customer's erp system and for them this is where the value is at because they don't need to have an entire stream of, of accountants sitting there ringing the bank trying to organize payment instructions these are all digitized and executed via the cloud to their banks and the statements come back and balance in their treasury system um, and be, for all intents and purposes, balance their books, not in real time, but in close to it. So really, I'm just trying to use that as an example of where it simplifies the overall process. It speeds up their accountancy processes. Um, so that's kind of just one example that I wanted to kind of relay. Uh, I think it's, 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 it's relevant in that scenario. But please, I open up to everyone else as well. Like, you know, I'm curious to hear other yeah, business scenarios. That multi-bank connectivity is very important because I know... Um, in terms of my personal experience uh, for credit check sort of thing, uh, like so many hurdles. And believe me, in terms of uh, terminologies and uh, words, they literally quarrel, two banks literally quarrel with each other. Like one, <laughs> bank, was, one bank was saying that uh, you have to write that this person has no loan uh, uh, before uh, this date or something. And then, uh, but the other bank was say, uh, say, they said, there is no liability of this person. And they say, no, this is not right. No liability doesn't mean <laughs> loan. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so I think uh, that is very good that multi-bank interconnectivity sort of thing. So uh, yeah, so um, anyone can add more? Exactly. So I might, um... Probably one of the industry things that you've seen play out. So I've been in the current role I'm in for about seven years, which some people on this call probably seems like a lifetime. But uh, one of the things that you start, like if you look at the origins of what people were doing in cloud computing, originally it was right, we'll virtualize that gray box that's normally under someone's desk. And it ended up being, well, we'll do compute, storage, and networking. That's what we'll offer people. And in order to leverage cloud computing, you kind of had to be an expert. You had to kind of know how to build and put things together. And that was a narrow market. It was a lucrative one, but it was a narrow market. And then they got much more into um, building it out as a service and as a platform that's more accessible. And as cloud computing, computing continues, they're going further and further into that. And there's two key call in that, one of which is, I used an analogy a long time ago, which I thought was fun, but people made fun of me afterwards. But the idea of cloud computing is telling someone who owns a horse that they need a car and they buy a car but that's part of the journey. They still don't know how to drive. And that's the point, like when people start using stuff in the cloud computing arena, they may be on the start of the right journey. They're probably nowhere near where they need to be. And simple things, it's a thing in the industry called lift and shift, where you take something out of your own data center or the gray box under your desk, whatever it is in your company, you put it in the cloud, but you haven't leveraged any of the benefits that the cloud brings in terms of architecture, resilience, scalability. I need a new server, I can have one in 30 seconds you haven't got on board with that yet. So moving stuff to the cloud is just the start of the journey. And that's probably one of the big call outs. The second thing is every cloud service provider has become much more specialized at delivering individual service and function people need. 
And that's probably a thing as sort of the future of cloud as well, where originally if you wanted to put database functionality into the cloud, you would put together some compute storage and networking and build a server and then load SQL database and put all the things together. Now on any major cloud provider, you can press a button and say, can I have a database? And literally they deliver a pre-made database ready to go, or they deliver it in a SaaS version where there's a software offering or a PaaS service directly enabled for you so you can just start using it. And that's probably things in terms of the journey that people are taking. It's much easier and there's a much lower, less steep learning curve to onboard to use in the cloud, but the value that you can get out of it is rising all the time. I think it's uh, it's very interesting that the, the the providers can offer services as small as a little one person startup where they need to have a website running and they get maybe five clicks a day uh, up to a multinational company running a big piece of software like SAP that they need to give the, the service out to hundreds of thousands of people. Um, and yet they can easily operate a service that can do can look after both of those people. So uh, do you want to add something, Vilaja? I like I was thinking and as the colleagues are talking, everyone has more uh, experience in the industry than me. Uh, but uh, like, I don't know, cloud can do everything nowadays. Like I was just thinking of examples from like success factors. And as I said, as just a software as a service kind of that we have. And that kind of goes to Michael's point, you know, that it's just like a big, uh, like a small piece of the puzzle that, when we are talking about the cloud. But it's like, during pandemic, we've seen all this, you know, software just provide like instant services, like uh, success factors had something where we could, you know, help employees go back to work by uploading their COVID related data or like vaccine certificates. And that happened really quick just because it was in the cloud. And, you know, if all of this had to be like manually done, it would have taken longer and like trying to have all these processes, um, it's much easier to have them simplified if you are operating in the cloud or if you are thinking now with like the cloud and what people are trying to do. And if you're like thinking in terms of a customer, right? And if you're operating in the cloud and you have um, different channels and you want to like understand your customer and listen to your customer, you'd need somehow to manage all the amount of data that you're getting and with this like again we are getting offerings as the customer data platforms that are you know coming up now and that's uh, again something that's if you had you know still like a manual or a more like on-prem kind of system would be great to, uh, it would be harder to pull out all this data and sort through it and, you know, create this like perfect persona of a user that is using it. But because everything is so easy to access and navigate and educate people on, it's much, uh, it brings a lot of value. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So, yeah, students can ask question or you can um, directly, you can ask or even you can type in chat. So Kevin is asking, is it rare to have one cloud service communicate access another cloud service from a different provider? And David can answer this question. So David. Um, yeah, sure. Um, so it, it is very possible. And I think that's, that's one of the key value adds of cloud these days, particularly for cloud providers is the extensibility and the ability to leverage other cloud providers to supplement their customers. And I can give a very particular example of this. Again, go back to my own experience in, with multi-bank connectivity. But for instance, our customer base is primarily SAP corporate customers, as you know. So we want to connect them to financial institutions. Now doing that repetitively takes time and takes effort, you know, and, and customers really want to, to minimize the amount of effort they need to expend to build these connections and so on. Um, if you look at a company like Swift, for instance, they are a network, business network, um, that primarily links banks to one another. And they exchange data between various banks globally. Um, so from our perspective, we partnered up with Swift um, because we have a large corporate customer base that wish to connect to banks. Swift is a network of banks. So I think the logical kind of bridge there is to, to integrate with them. And the point I'm making here is us as a, as a cloud provider with our solution, multi-bank connectivity, have connected to another cloud provider, Swift, um, to make that onboarding or connection journey for our customers a lot simpler. Um, 
that, that, that's just one example of how clouds leverage one another, I think, to, 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 to kind of supplement their customer base and their value offering for customers. If you look, look at another example, I don't know if anyone here uses Shopify. Um, I have a small Shopify store, right? And I'm not, it's definitely not a retirement plan or anything like that, but I really just did it as a hobby. But it's a good example of how Shopify is delivered as a cloud service fundamentally, where it's an e-commerce store. But they have extensibility and options to link into other service providers. So for instance, you can get t-shirts made or photos printed from various service providers. And that capability is out, literally out of the box with your Shopify account. You can, you can enable those connections, go into a little setting thing and say, I want to, to, to use this supplier. So that, that pre-exists. So really what you're doing is you're leveraging, it's again, pre, predefined cloud integration. You know, so it, it kind of, it's, it's cloud service providers supplementing one another's service offerings. And I think that is a very, very common thing. I know even with, for instance, Michael with Azure and SAP and offering SAP ERP systems on Azure, that's that's a very big partnership that's going on now um, and strategic for both, you know. So I think, yeah, there is cloud to cloud integrations and maybe I've over answered Kevin, but I hope it, it has helped somewhat to kind of clarify that. For you. There's numbers about how many companies use multiple clouds. Um, and I, the one I heard recently was about 55% of companies that are in the cloud will use wow. multiple providers for it. Uh, I think that's a massive underestimation because even if they don't use two providers, so if the company is just stuck on just Amazon or just Google, what they don't realize is that when they're building code, they're using Azure to do the login, they're using uh, Google to do the actual building of the code because um, the service they use from another company is based in, in Google. So they are actually using multi-cloud every single day. I'd say it's 99.9% .9 of companies. But they don't see it, I suppose, Ed. It's kind of the, yeah, yeah. I get you, I get you. It's, yeah. it's kind of hidden in the background because they're using yeah. other providers who use other providers. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. Good pointer, yeah. I suppose another thing to call out is in terms of interoperability. The question was phrased like, one cloud service communicate access to another. But actually a lot of time now, cloud service provision is done in the way it's, it's up to the customers what they want to do with their cloud resources. Um, <clears throat> so obviously we work with the various different industry segments. I'm going to pick financial services as one, but I know because of requirements from financial regulators, a lot of financial services industries will have a multi-cloud requirement. So they do not have single points of failure. If there is a major outage in one that they can have continuity. Imagine if you're like a, a clearinghouse or a credit card payments company or whatever, the financial regulator in your country is going to make want to make sure that you're pretty robust. So most companies that get above a certain scale tend to default towards a multi-cloud policy, sometimes for resilience and sometimes to keep their cloud service provider earnest and honest and making sure that they are offering the best value and they are offering the best levels of stability and service. So it's very common. It will become more common. Thank you. So, yeah. Um, so, uh, Ed, you are working uh, on customer facing applications. And uh, I know uh, because, in terms of customers, as a customer, I have appetite for instant information and services. So, uh, it would be good if you can uh, define or prospect or future of these uh, customer facing applications, uh, cloud based. Uh, customer facing applications. So that would be good. Yep, certainly. Uh, if you go back a few years, um, the site was either up or down the server running a website or an app was either turned on or it was on fire. Um, we've had high, av high availability now for, for quite a few years where you always have at least two servers, two networks, two connections. If you have at least two of everything, it means that when something fails, you simply flip over automatically to the other one. So it gives you uh, the, the service is always there. Um, now things are have to be faster and faster and faster. The data has to be with you very quickly uh, very efficiently. So now uh, you can take that even further and have a content delivery system where um, people in America will receive their data from a hub in America. People in Europe receive it from Europe. So it just means that they're, they're not tra um, waiting for data to transfer over cables, over connections. It's there very, very quickly. Um, as we move forward, it moves further in that direction. We, we will get data information to people faster and more reliably than ever. That becomes a hell of a lot easier with the cloud because if you're trying to run all these services yourself, it's very difficult. Whereas you can go to a provider and say, I want to have a server based in every single country in the world. And they can't quite do that yet, but they're, they're getting closer. Okay. 
Thank you. So uh, if anyone can add more about customer facing applications, if they can give some example or- I can, I, I can have a stab um, at it. Um, I think uh, one of the things that, that I think we find these days with customers, again, you mentioned there, they want data, customers want data and they want access to it quick mm -hmm. and they want to make sense of it quite quickly too. I mean, it's, it's one thing having an excellent stream of data flowing from one point to another, but being able to monitor that data, make sense of it and derive meaning from it is, is, is kind of one of the key things that we have to try and provide for our customers. Um, and, and that can be, that can be tricky at times because, and again, I'm, I'm going back to, to an integration scenario. Let's just assume we have two clouds. There's data flowing between point A and point B. The customer wants to have a window there in the middle and see what's, what's flowing between two points. And they want to extrapolate that data. And like I said, turn it into meaning or, or turn it into something meaningful that they can, you know, use to analyze their business process. It kind of probably comes back to another situation where you could outsource that data to another cloud provider to actually make sense of and position it via a web-facing UI, for instance, um, with some nice pie charts and graphs and stuff that your operations team can sit down and look into um, and take some meaning from. Um, that, it's a bit of a loose example, but I, I'm just trying to kind of, yeah, um, I suppose add a little bit. Hope that makes sense at least. Okay. So, um, okay. So, yeah. Mm. Anything do you want to add, Michael? Um, so the topic was a bit broad, but in terms of, is it like customer facing interoperability? I'm not quite sure mm -hmm. what we were. Yeah, um, customer facing applications, like what is the um, prospect of cloud-based customer facing applications, especially when your customer needs very instant information and services. Uh, yeah. And, so in terms of what is a future, uh, yeah, I suppose the best way to think about the cloud for a lot of these kind of questions is to think of it as a set of tools or resources. And it is what the customer then wants to do with them and what they want to make of them. So if you want to build a fairly simple service, if you have what's known as a mom and pop store and you just want a website, like you can leverage the cloud for that. You can build it on-prem. But as you start to leverage cloud for what you do, what you want to do with the tool cut is kind of more what is going to be the guiding factor here customer facing applications there's very few things in the cloud that aren't tangibly customer facing at some part like in the end there has to be a reason why you're doing it and the reason is revenue and revenue is customers so whether it's directly facing or it's internal systems that empower other things they all have a customer impact but stuff that we provide directly to end customers when we're talking about azure and we i do a lot of sort of industry and early career things where we talk about millions of customers, billions of end users. And that's probably the differentiation and the scale point. And all other people who work in different cloud service providers can talk about that because they have their direct customers who build stuff in their cloud, but then they build stuff for their end customers. And the toolkits for doing that are getting more and more sophisticated. And particularly when you get into the areas like SaaS provision, it's an almost end-to-end -end solution that you can pass directly to your end customers. And that's probably, I think, somewhere where this question was going, but the industry is getting much more sophisticated at having bespoke out-of-the-box solutions that you can pass directly to your end customer and that represent or empower your business. And that's definitely a trend that's going to keep going because needing expertise on how to build stuff in the cloud is a little counterintuitive. Cloud service provisions about enabling your business, not you being an expert in the cloud. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So, um... One important question like nowadays we are facing in terms of uh, cyber attacks. So uh, students are very curious about uh, learning about more uh, security in cloud computing. So uh, if you can talk about security, because uh, in terms of like, uh, we come to know that in many uh, organizations when we have like, we have do cyber attacks on small, on big organizations on individual, organizations, but we haven't heard so many cyber attacks on cloud computing infrastructure. I don't know, they are not telling us or we are not following them, but obviously I know they would definitely facing a lot of cyber attacks as well. So uh, if you can um, discuss security issues with cloud computing, um, it would be good for students and for me as well. Um, I can jump in if people want. Go for it, uh, so I'm going to post a link 
I can't type and talk at the same time. It's a massive human failing of me. <laughs> Uh, that's me typing like five words and it took me that long. Uh, so there's a public article I just posted there. But um, the interesting thing in cloud, I'd say over the last few years is how comfortable all cloud service providers have gotten with talking about security in the cloud and talking about the fact that there are bad actors in the world. Um, and it is, there was a turning point on this simply because the original position of cloud is extremely secure, it is extremely stable. And anyone who's been in the industry for a while has come from that is how we sell it to customers. But there is a point where you have to enable your customers to tell that story to their end customers. And the story of don't worry, we're secure in the light of the current environment that we see is not a story that resonates anymore. What they want to know is how invested are you in this? How much do you fully understand the landscape that's out there and what do you do? Um, I think most major cloud service providers have been fairly vocal and public on it. I post a link to one article, but because of the nature of the services that Microsoft does, we do security work for ourselves and for customers and we're in the middle of quite a lot of like government stuff and other things so we see thousands upon thousands of attacks per day an attack is denial of service it's attempt to compromise it's attempt to gain illicit access all the definitions that we think of and silly things can happen like a customer can get their credentials compromised and their stuff can be accessed that happens that's not anything really to do with the cloud. That's to do with how customers manage credentials and how they manage security. But giving people the ability to deal with attacks like that, that's where cloud service providers have brought an extra value add. Um, there was the, I think it was the WannaCry ransomware that went around before. There was a few different eras of ransomware that get the news for quite a while. We stop hearing about them, but for certain companies to get impacted, there's massive financial pain and impact. And a lot of cloud service providers now actually have the ability to wind the customer's infrastructure back by a number of days. So if they get hit by a particular form of malware or ransomware, they can actually sidestep it back to a version of their environment that was working perfectly. So things like that in the industry where we empower customers to recover from these things, I'd say that's the principal part of the industry where you see the most value for customers. But everyone representing a major cloud service company here is working with colleagues, thousands upon thousands of colleagues, who make sure that these things are not impactful on a daily basis. When the whole cloud was starting to form, um, a lot of businesses were very, very scared because they were taking their server that was in the basement of their building and they were giving it off to someone else who they had no idea what this person was called, where they lived. They, they had no, no fallback on the person. There, so they had no security to, to know that they were going to look after the server properly. Um, what has become very obvious since the cloud has been there or since we started using it is that the security that they had before was not secure at all in that the the person who does the cleaning of the building probably had keys to go into the computer room and could walk around behind the servers whereas that never happens in a big data center the people are all very very secure vetted um, people just cannot walk around and do things with the servers uh, or even physically get to them. They may, they're probably locked inside cabinets that have no access at all. Um, the whole idea of firewalls has got 100 times better. So uh, before it used to be the firewall was around the whole perimeter of the network and it just kept you out of the, the network area. Whereas now um, each individual machine or maybe each individual, in, individual hard drive for each machine is firewalled by itself. So the security is a lot more clever than it used to be. Uh, we have a lot more control over the individual components. I think um, just something to add there. I mean, in, in general, like as, as we've migrated now into this cloud world, and, and we really are living in a cloud world, I heard it referred to before as, as the Industrial Revolution 4.0, which I thought was quite cool. I mean, it's, it's the, the cloud underpins an awful lot of what we do. As we move into the cloud and as an awful lot of businesses start to leverage clouds, the surface area that's vulnerable to attack for them becomes a lot bigger also. So an awful lot of, of, server, of cloud providers, Michael already said, I mean, security is a huge, huge focus for cloud providers, full stop. Um, but I think one of the things that supplements that is also you have to consider the industries in which these clouds work in. So for instance, you know, there are industry best practices like PSD2 in the finance sector, for instance, which is like a European standard for that, that um, cloud companies that handle payment data need to adhere to. 
each industry has their own kind of standards and these are constantly evolving along with the ISO standards, for instance, the, the International Standards Organization. Um, these are constantly evolving to try and keep up with the, with the latest level of, of, of security and, and I suppose best practices that companies need to adhere to. And these are more industry specific as opposed to kind of, there are also gener general cloud ones such as like NIST and, and SOC and so on. Um, but it's a massive, massive focus. And I suppose for the purposes of students, um, it's, it's it, in my own personal opinion it's definitely an area that will just continue to grow in terms of its its relevance for cloud products um because it's constantly evolving you know so are the methods that are used to attack cloud services are constantly evolving um but uh, but yeah it's definitely a massive massive thing i think for every for every cloud service at the moment is is security and compliance even yeah. okay okay thank you so in terms of cloud computing security Vlada, do you want to add something uh yeah, again, just to reiterate, like I wouldn't uh, hear about, you know, the cloud security a lot myself, just purely because of the role I'm in. But again, this is all taken care, you know, very closely uh, and very strongly by all the teams that are dealing with it. But if I'm thinking in terms of like how I deal with my customers and from a success factors perspective, we store a lot of data, right? And especially like you've seen GDPR uh, that came in like many years ago, but um, a lot of customers still had data or like, let's say we do recruiting or something and a candidate has gone through in the system, they have some data, but they actually didn't uh, stay with a company and they all want that data deleted. And that's something that, you know, it might not be compliant if it's not done at the right time. So this all goes to kind of showing that you still have to constantly educate your customer to ensure that SAP is compliant and the customer is compliant as well. Just because of the pure nature of the business of the cloud, it always will be data and it always will mean educating uh, not only the customer, but educating yourself and knowing what there is, what kind of data is stored. Um, again, what to like to what David said. Um, what is the industry best practice? What kind of things are compliant, not compliant? What's coming up? Um, as well, like if I'm thinking back to uh, success factors and what I do, we've had. Um, you know, integration of a lot of different kind of documents and signatures from all the countries or even with COVID, some countries were allowing that to be done in the system, some countries weren't, uh, didn't, just because, again, of uh, pure compliance and security. So it's all very particular, but one thing is for sure that you'll have to be educated and kind of stay on top, at least with knowing what is important um, in this time and what can be in the future. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So um, I think we have uh, time for one very important question regarding to students like uh, definitely when they are trying to pursue their career in terms of uh, cloud computing, they, they can choose different paths, right? So I would say uh, if you can um, highlight different paths they can adopt from, because uh, most of the students in this class, they are doing MSc in information systems management. And uh, there are a few other students who are doing um, certificate in postgraduate certificate in cybersecurity. So uh, what are the skills, what, what are the options uh, in industry if they don't want to go in a more technical path or if they want to go in more in terms of managerial uh, sort of thing. So I think uh, that would be very helpful for our students um, because they are, mm, soon they would be graduated mm, in two, three months. So definitely they would be looking for, uh, if they are looking for career planning in uh, cloud computing domain. So, uh, Ed, if you can start, um, like what sort of skills or what are the uh, possible paths uh, they have options or yep. skills? Um, in a recent survey, 39% of companies surveyed said that they didn't have enough skills to deal with the cloud properly. So this is a massive, massive area for growth. Um, Anyone who says that they they know everything about the cloud, they're they're a fool themselves because it changes literally day by day. Uh, the great providers that we have, they invent new services every single day. So this is something that is it's going to be an ongoing learning 
for the whole time you're doing this. Uh, which areas should you study? It totally, totally depends on where your interests are. So the areas I deal with the most would be the developers, uh, the QA staff, the DevOps, uh, testing people. These are even inside those generic roles, there are divisions that you can study. So I would say um, look at something that you are interested in because if you can get the, the amazing bonus of having your job, um, your career, the same as your hobby, then you win on every level. It's a perfect way to live your life. Um, so just look at something you enjoy doing. Uh, if you enjoy coding, get into coding. If you enjoy security and how that works, look into a course on that. Um, a great thing to do would be to go to somewhere like uh, LinkedIn or one of the job sites uh, to put in uh, some details about what you're after and just look at the jobs that come up. It gives you an idea of um, maybe salaries, locations, the number of jobs that will appear. Um, some Quite often they'll have a job description that tells you what you'll be doing or gives you a, just key points of what you're doing. Uh, again, look for something that interests you. That's it. Okay. Pilada? Yeah, so um, I think I'm just going to build up on what Ed has said and just talk more about the importance of soft skills as well, because I could be talking now about all the, you know, certificates you could be getting, but probably students are more aware than me because that's like if you Google the first, um, you know, search answer that comes up would be like all this uh, certificates, like let's say Azure or AWS or Compa or whatever there is, you know, but I think um, like what I've seen personally, we because when I came in, I kind of started on the implementation side uh, of things. And then, like, I came from a very mixed uh, background, like in business information system, you studied both. Um, and I think you studied the mindset of the cloud. You're not a computer science graduate and you're not a pure commerce graduate. And I think this is great because you learn to navigate the cloud world in a way. So I think it's um, once at least, you know, you have an idea um, again, that's what I did myself. And that's what I sometimes do. I'm like, what do I want to learn more? So I would search up, you know, all this like jobs and see like what is actually wanted in the industry and what am I curious to learn? Because let's say I want to go now and do a course that maybe someone doesn't think is as great, but then that gives me the unique value right and you never know when you might have to use this in your future or right now and like, that's the thing because the cloud is so evolved. Um, evolving and fast um, you'll never have all the skills again and this was reiterated a few times but you can you know be that person that has a different skill set that might come in handy at any time and uh, what I've just seen is like keep staying kind of open um, network with people because that personally is very important to me and that what feeds me to um, kind of stay motivated to learn more because if you think you're stopped learning now it's not true like and I mean you'd kind of feel bored if you don't learn more you'll feel like hey I need to you know get something new and keep up with whatever is happening um so of course like uh, if you were we are talking about more technical skills it's like to stay up uh, up to date with like everything like Azure AWS and I wouldn't say I'm certified in any of this but I made sure that I went and familiarized myself and you know same with kind of like all the uh, blockchain crypto AI I couldn't say that I am an expert but because you're working in the cloud it's good to have an understanding and just kind of uh, pitch up your own curiosity that you might be going um, to use one day and kind of uh, go into that direction um, as well a big thing is like just develop a mindset for like a change management in a way or just um, I think be ready to take on bigger things especially if we are talking about manager position so what i do is like i know myself that i'd love to go into a leadership position and i keep um you know this kind of focus in the front and i make sure that you know i make this kind of clear to either my managers or to either like people that i'm working with and i say hey i need a challenge i'll find this challenge myself or like you know um you can provide me with an opportunity where i can get challenged and develop in that direction and i think that's very important as an even individual you need to showcase this openness and also that you are ready for you know bigger things although you might be coming for from a very i don't know like let's say cyber security but you're not interested only in that um so i think that's kind of all from my side um, i think soft skills are still as important as you know the 
that's technical skill just purely because we are still going to deal with humans um, and not just with AI, let's say. Okay, so yeah, because the cloud computing is a big spectrum and in terms of soft skills and technical skills. So uh, Michael, do you want to add uh, something? And especially because Microsoft is also uh, very in in terms of doing research. So uh, yeah. if you can, uh, because I still believe there is a lot of people can do uh, or students can go with research in cloud computing. So if you can. Yeah. Uh, so probably I'd say uh, the first thing to bear in mind is given the audience that is here is that sometimes there's a bit of mentally trying to work out the transition from a thing I work in college to work in like cloud service provision in the real world and this these two don't connect at all and the thing we found like multinationals i to be very honest traditionally have been very bad at recruitment and very bad at positioning themselves with candidates you know please try scale the epic wall of our interview process and all the silly things that you've heard about and most of the major companies have gotten much better at understanding what we're actually looking for is the untrainable core values that we're looking for in people and outside of that, there are trainable skills and on the job learning that none of us working in cloud had when we started. And there's an awful lot of things that you will only learn when you're in the position. But being useful, being determined, and being able to step a little back from stuff and work out why am I doing something? If those are things that kind of underpin what you do, whatever, regardless of the technical skills that you bring to it, there are things that are going to sort of help up level your ability to deliver, your ability to be someone who's a relevant candidate in a cloud computing sphere. We have people working across cloud computing from very much not technical at all, all the way to people who can understand and read entire code traces in 15 seconds. And I don't know how those people do it either, but they do. And they are able to make very clever things happen. But no one person in that spectrum is more or less important than the other, because all of them adds up to being the solutions that help us present what we need to our customers. So. Don't think you're too technical. Don't think that you're unable to make the leap, but do think, how can I be useful? How can I be applicable? How can I be the person who makes something happen? And if those are things that underpin what you do, you're probably gonna have interesting conversations with multinationals, smaller companies, anyone in the technology sector, because that mindset and those core cultural values, they're the things people really struggle to find. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Michael. So David, do you want to add um. I, 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 it's, it's, that's hard to follow because they're all really, really valid points. Um, like I think touching on the technical side of things, the, there is massive scope for career progression in cloud. Um, you go anywhere from DevOps um, is massive. It's huge. It's, it's how we operate and run the cloud fundamentally. You have uh, delivery and implementation. You have cybersecurity, huge, huge thing. You know, and so there's there's a lot of different avenues. I think. Michael, what you've said about, about the soft skills and kind of what people bring, individuals bring to a role is very, very valid and relevant because even when I look at my own team, there's such a varied skill set and backgrounds there. Um, and and the, the technical stuff can, is teachable and you will pick that up and you will be shown how to do that. But bringing, bringing to the table um, a, good, a, a good, I suppose, work ethic an ability to, to, to understand problems and, and work through logically solving problems um, if you can display and demonstrate that and develop that those skills, um, I think that can only benefit you going forward for for any kind of role in the cloud. Um, I'd be hard pressed to, to 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 give a direction. We mentioned cybersecurity earlier on. My own personal opinion, I think that's a massive, massive thing and only getting bigger. And um, cybersecurity and compliance, and I think once you get into the nuances, like I mentioned, of industry specifics, there, there's a whole world of stuff there. Lots of room for people to. To, to upscale and, and get their heads around and bring value to, to companies um, that are operating in the cloud in those industries. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't really have much else to add other than that. I mean, I think um, if, if anyone has any questions, I'd offer to any guys on, on the call, any students or anything, feel free to reach out. I'd happily help, you know, uh, you can have me on LinkedIn or whatever. Uh, I'd be happy to help anyone if you have any questions about cloud delivery, cloud solution, if I can help, I can, yeah, no problem. Okay, thank you. So we are running short of time and uh, I think uh, we can uh, come to the last section of this panel discussion. So I would say if you, uh, as a final note, if you want to say anything 
about uh, possible future of cloud or some special advice to students. So uh, you can say, so we can start with Ed. Uh, for me, one of the most important things, not necessarily about the, the listeners today, but one of the most important things in cloud is that it becomes a lot more ecologically friendly. Um, the companies are all making massive steps towards this, but we actually need you as the new employees to come on and give us great paths forward, uh, do things like make it eco-friendly, make it uh, a more sustainable system, uh, and also make it a more interesting place. So uh, by all means, if you're interested in cloud, join in, get a great job and uh, enjoy it. Okay, thank you. So, Michael? Um, yeah, I actually have to drop because I'm, I'm running for an interview, but I, I probably the takeaways I put for everyone on this is the fact that you're here means you've got an interest and there is a very large industry going in directions where we're not sure. And to be honest, the people who set the directions for where we are in 20 years time will probably not be the people on this call. We will help, we will support, we will grow. But some of the vision and some of the future stuff is people who have not yet joined major technology, major industry or anything else. That's the way industry goes, it always has been. And the future of this, if you were to take the convergence of photography, messaging and telephony into a single device that sits in your pocket, 30 years ago, a few people might've been talking about it, but most people didn't know about it. That's probably where we are now in terms of where te technology is gonna go as well. But being in the middle of it, there's gonna be an awful lot of interesting things to do. So where we're going, I really absolutely would be lying if I told you I had even the slightest idea of where the next 10 years will look, but I'm very excited to be in the middle of it. And hopefully a few of you will get the opportunity to do the same. Um, feel free to add any of us on LinkedIn that you find as well. Um, we're more than happy to have connections. I presume I'm speaking for everyone. Um, and yeah, thank you very much to everyone who took the time today. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Velada, if you uh, just say some yeah. closing remarks. Yeah. So I'll just keep it very short, just like be open minded, flexible, creative, disrupting um, and have a, I don't know, your own kind of um, persona, because I think that's what's the most important. Uh, you're all going to bring something individual to, you know, whatever you go to work or if you decide to work for yourself. But again, try to stay ethical <laughs> where possible um, to try to make a better world, I guess. Yeah. And uh, totally agree with what Michael said. Feel free to add on LinkedIn. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, yeah, David. Or oh. um, I, I, one minor addition, I suppose. Um, yeah, just don't be shy. Don't reach out to people. Ask the questions. If you're unsure where to go, um, or kind of if you're unsure what a certain job means or what it looks like, find someone who knows and ask them about it. You, you, when you ask the question, you'll find that people are very supportive and very helpful. And an honest question always gets an honest answer. So don't be afraid to, to ask questions and help define your own path. You know, so that's that's, that's the only, the, 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 yeah, sounds cliche, but the world is your oyster. It's up to you to figure out where you want to go. And, and there's lots of people there to help. Just to add on that as well, um, if you're kind of, you know, finding your own path, sometimes like what I found and what I asked for is, for different mentors and I went to people myself and I just said hey I want to be mentored by you if you don't mind and like currently my mentor is like a manager that's been in I don't know the business for many 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 years and I've never taught that he'd agree and he did you know and that's because I asked and I think that's very important to to have mentors maybe from work or from different areas um, and you'd be surprised like uh, through LinkedIn as well that's how it's working and I think people are more open for this and to mentor and be mentored as well. Okay. Okay, so thank you. Um, I think we can close uh, this panel discussion and on the behalf of BIS and all students of this course, uh, we are very grateful to all four of you for your time and your uh, very valuable uh, insights of cloud computing. And definitely uh, in future, we would be in touch in terms of uh, research or in terms of career uh, counseling sort of thing. So thank you very much, uh, Michael, Ed, and um, um, two people from SAP, so uh, David and Vlada. So we are very thankful to you. And hopefully we will meet in person sometime and 
have some coffee. <laughs> so coffee and some meetup is due uh, on BIS, on NUI Galway. So definitely we will plan and uh, we will ask uh, Tom as well to join us. And then um, definitely we will discuss more things as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Uh, Thank thanks, you. everyone. Bye. Talk to you. Bye-bye. Thanks Bye. for having us. Thank you.